rotation happens perpendicular to whatever that spinal angle is. That's all it means. It's not as complicated as it sounds. And then the second piece of that is that the arm slot matches that rotation. So if my rotation is happening in this plane, the arm needs to find its way into that plane. Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here with Triathletics. Uh, got a lot of requests to do another mechanical analysis, so we're going to take uh, you know, 20, 25 minutes here. Uh, hopefully we can get through in that amount of time and kind of break down Marcus Stroman's mechanics. Um, he is a guy who has very, very efficient mechanics and a lot of guys are asking, how does he throw so hard at such a, such a small stature at five foot eight? Uh, obviously he has to do a lot of things very well. Obviously he's a good athlete, um, but we're just gonna break down in a little bit more detail uh, what exactly about his mechanics allow him to throw so hard. Um, we have developed a, a fairly detailed uh, mechanical analysis checklist, so we're actually going to use that as kind of a, a model and go through that step by step and show you what I'm seeing when I, when I look at his mechanics uh, piece by piece. So with that being said, let's get into it. Hopefully you guys take something away from this. Make sure to leave a comment down below if you have a specific picture you want us to analyze in the future. And if you have any other further questions for, uh, for a future Q&A, make sure to leave those as well. So with that being said, let's get into this. Uh, I'm going to play the clip first. Uh, my good friend Pitching Ninja, Rob Friedman, posted this originally. Um, so we're just going to show both the angles, roll through it one time. So you can just see visually at a glance, uh, very, very smooth uh, and efficient energy transfer. Um, very little lags, very few leaks in how he how he moves, how he transfers his energy. And just at a glance, how athletic he looks uh, when he throws. Uh, he's a guy who, you know, consistently throws in the mid 90s, but he's been up to 100 in the past, uh, especially in college when he would just kind of come in from shortstop. Uh, we actually played against him uh, when he pitched for Duke. Uh, he pitched against us and just watching him kind of come in and, uh, you know, throw 93, 94, 97, um, seemingly effortlessly. Um, you know, there's something special about the way he moves. So let's kind of get into it. And uh, we're gonna start with the setup and first move. So I know we can't see his entire setup and how he, how he comes set from these particular clips. But basically we're looking at uh, just general posture, uh, foot position, is that foot caving in? Is he externally rotated, is he internally rotated? Is he starting in a kind of a hunched over or a leaning back position where his hands in that initial starting position? Um, there's not too much notable here. Uh, he's, he's starting balanced, he's starting uh, center of mass over that uh, midfoot on the back foot. His eyes are locked on the target. His hands are in a, a pretty standard position right here. I like to see the hands in kind of the midline of the body. Um, typically when athletes have their, that hand more towards the front hip or towards the back hip when they come set, um, you tend to see problems where the glove arm and the throwing arm kind of get out of sync relative to one another. So I like the hands in the middle of the body, whether that's at the waist or at the chest a little bit higher. Um, and then just kind of seeing that torso stacked over the back hip and seeing, uh, seeing that foot balance as well, not caving in, not caving out, um, weight not too far towards the heel or the toe. So no issues with the starting posture. So we're gonna give him a good there. Uh, leg lift and initial weight shift. So we're looking at that first move towards the target. It's not necessarily about the style of the, weight, of the leg lift. It's not about, um, you know, just how high he lifts the leg. It's not about, um, you know, which direction that toe is pointing. I know that used to be a debate uh, in kind of pitching mechanic circles. Should that toe be pointing down or up? Uh, I'm not as concerned with the stylistic differences of the, of the leg lift. The point of the leg lift uh, and the point of uh, that first move is to initiate a shift of that center of mass down the mound forwards. And what that does, not only are we preloading that back hip, but we're shifting that center of mass away from the rubber so that once we actually do get into that back leg drive, that back leg drive can apply a more lateral direction of force into the ground. So I'm just gonna demo that real quick for you guys. So if your first move is just a balance point and from there you shoot the hips forward and just kind of artificially reach that front hip forward, we can't really create as lateral force vectors off the back leg. But if that first move gets you going down the mound, you start to create some distance with your center of mass, now you can really get into your back leg and create a lateral force uh, off, the back, off the back leg and into the ground. Um, so that's really all it is, is looking for this, what we call the drift position uh, during the leg lift. And if you guys want more information and haven't already read my article on the drift, I'll make sure to link that in the description below. 
Um, but that's one thing he does really, really well. As you'll notice, as he initiates that first move, his center of mass goes forward. It looks subtle, but we're looking at, you can imagine the belly button, that's the center, center of mass. Um, that's moving forward three, four, five, six inches during his leg lift. So by the time he actually hits that back leg drive right there, this is when he actually hits the drive, right there. That's when he starts to sit into the back leg. By the time he gets to that position, his belly button's already traveled, let's see, from right about here. So his belly button's already traveled about six inches forward, which allows him to create those better angles and actually get into the back glute. So as far as leg lift and initial weight shift, we're gonna give him good there. Um, it's worth noting as well that you don't necessarily need a big leg lift to have a good and, and proper weight shift. If you look at any MLB guy who throws hard and you look at the way that they move out of their slide step as well, or out of an abbreviated leg lift if they're trying to hold runners on base, they still have a forward uh, shifting of their weight during that first move. Whether or not they get that knee up to their chest or up to their uh, you know, letters or up to their waist, up to their waist um, that's not as important as just shifting that belly button forward during their initial uh, uh, weight shift. So let's get into the back leg now. Uh, the first thing and one of the most important things with regards to the back leg is engaging the rear glute. We're trying to drive towards the target using that lateral hip musculature, so glute med, glute min, um, and being able to really sit into that, that musculature so it's not a quad driven drive um, towards the plate, but rather it's, it's driven and controlled by the glute. Uh, the glute has a lot of control over what the pelvis is doing, um, it's, it has a lot of control over what the center of mass is doing, and it's also one of the biggest muscles in our body, one of the most powerful muscles in our body. So the more we can engage that glute and feel that glute active and stay into that glute longer, um, the better we're going to be able to transfer that energy up the chain if we can sequence it further in the chain. So let's look at how he engages that back glute. So as he lifts his leg, notice that he's getting a little bit of posterior tilt. He's tilting that pelvis back and he's also getting a little bit of sit in that back leg. He's not entirely straight on that back leg. He's sitting into it and in doing so, he's feeling that glute load up. I also want you to notice from this slight angle position, watch how he coils into that glute. He's not just lifting his leg straight up, he's actually coiling against it and in doing so he's able to wind it and create tension on it. So he's actually winding it into a little bit of internal rotation in this position, which allows him to then uncoil it into external rotation and abduction here. So he's winding it here, which preloads it, sets it up for unwinding here into external rotation abduction, and then he releases it into internal rotation. So that very first move, he's winding into the glute and getting a little bit of a downward sit and really feeling that energy load up right there in the glute. So engaging your glute, we're gonna give him a good on that as well. Uh, pushing slash overextending the back leg. Uh, we see this a lot in uh, lower velocity throwers. You'll still see this in guys who are in the upper 80s, low 90s, um, but very rarely once you start getting to mid 90s and above guys. And essentially what pushing or overextending the back leg is, when they get to this position, they get to the, maybe they have a good drive position here, but you get to them at landing. And instead of that knee turning down to the ground, corkscrewing down to the ground like he does here, they'll try to triple extend that back leg and push towards the target. And in doing so, it looks like they're lunging or leaping towards the target and this back leg gets completely straight and extended. Uh, that, that back foot tends to not be turned over. Um, they aren't able to keep that toe engaged as they rotate. And this essentially becomes one, uh, one big straight limb um, and it makes it hard to, to segment the lower half from the upper half. So guys tend to really, really struggle um, to get the hips to rotate ahead of the shoulders. They tend to all rotate as one unit. And again, that tends to happen primarily because they are pushing and overextending the back leg rather than corkscrewing it down to the ground. Notice he's corkscrewing it down to the ground. He's not lunging and jumping towards the target. That's extremely important from being able to take that linear move towards the target right here and convert that into a rotational move. You need to convert that linear into rotation or there's no way that this rotational energy actually finds its way up the rest of the chain. So pitching is not just a car crash. It's not just a linear move and then a linear crash on the front leg and then a catapulting of the upper half. That's, that's a very simplistic uh, linear view of how the pitching motion works. That's not at all how it works. It's a linear slash lateral move here. And then from here, it's all converting that into rotation. It's converting 
right there. Knee down to the ground, pelvis rotates in the same plane, and then this is the whole tornado of energy that we talk about, where that rotation, 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 everything happens in that same plane that the shoulders ultimately rotate in and that the arm slot, uh, and that he ultimately displays in his arm slot. So he's not pushing or overextending the back leg, good. Uh, vertical shin angle versus early hip internal rotation. So uh, I've written an article about this in the past. Uh, I will link that in the description if you guys uh, have not already read it. Um, how athletes maintain this drive position and maintain consistent uh, contact with their back foot to the rubber so that they can be consistently, uh, so they can be applying force, lateral force into the ground over as long a range of motion as possible. How they do that is gonna be dependent on their hip anatomy and their, on their hip structure. So Stroman is an example of an athlete who has good hip abduction and good hip external rotation. He can keep this knee back, this vertical shin position, because his hips, are, his hips work in this position. Uh, I would hazard a guess to say that more than 50% of athletes should be uh, attempting to emulate this type of uh, back leg position during the drive phase. Um, however, some athletes have what's called antiverted hips. Their hip structure lends itself to where they have really good hip internal rotation, but they can't actually keep as vertical a shin position because they, they get a pinch in their hip, they get bone-on-bone -bone contact, um, and they just can't keep this externally rotated position. Um, I'm an athlete, uh, I'm, I'm an example of this myself, where if I try to keep too externally rotated of a back leg as I drive towards the target, um, I actually get that pinch in my hip. But if I turn that back foot in slightly, and I try to get my knee on the target early and drop that knee to the ground. Um, that works really, really well for me. Um, so this is an example, there isn't necessarily a right answer here with a vertical shin versus early hip internal rotation. Um, it's more based on the specific guy and what works for their structure. And if you see a guy who's, maybe he's trying to throw internally rotated, he's trying to get that knee down early, um, but he's just, he's really struggling. You're seeing that back foot wants to turn out. That would be an example where I'd, I'd flag him. And then vice versa, if you see a guy trying to keep that, that foot turned back and that knee back uh, towards shortstop, and it's just, it's, he's not able to do that. It's starting to leak early. Maybe there's an example where that guy needs to be cueing it a little bit differently. So not a right or wrong answer. It's more individual specific, but this works for his, his structure and his hip anatomy. Um, that goes hand in hand with the next point, which is staying in the heel, uh, not rising on the toes early. So you'll see, uh, you'll see some guys, they can't stay engaged with that back heel into the ground for very long. They'll get to this part of the drive phase and the very next thing they do is they begin to, the knee leaks forward and the weight shifts on the toes and you'll start to see daylight between the ground and that back heel. So they're, they're not able to actually maintain good solid uh, connect, connection with the ground and in doing so they're not able to be able to apply that lateral force vector into the ground back towards second base uh, for as long and because of that they're not able to create as much linear momentum through their center of mass. Now this can be from a number of different reasons. They might be missing mobility through their ankle, ankle dorsiflexion. Uh, they might have issues with their, with their foot uh, pronation, their tibia. They might be uh, tight through their groin that doesn't let them keep that knee back. Uh, there's a lot of reasons this can happen, but we don't want to come up on that toe too early. So I'm going to give him a good on that. He stays in the heel for a long time and he doesn't let that heel come up until just before landing when those hips start to rotate. Okay, the directionality of his drive, is he, is he striding open, is he striding closed? Um, you'll see a lot, of, uh, a lot of pitchers that they'll start to almost look like they're falling back towards first base for righty. Um, so that's not necessarily good. There's only a couple big leaguers who, who consistently do that and, and, and have success with it. Uh, Chris Davinsky is one example of that where you know, he kind of looks like he's falling back towards first base. Uh, most coaches at, at most levels kind of can see and identify that as and consider that a flaw. Um, so you typically won't see pitchers make it to the, to the higher levels unless they're really having success and able to kind of compensate for it, compensate for that. Um, when it comes to striding closed, um, that's a little bit different. I wouldn't necessarily consider that a flaw um, for certain guys if they're able to stay on time, they're able to rotate the hips, segment that from the shoulders, get the arm up on time, get in a good finished position, brace the front leg. If they're able to do everything and sequence it properly, um, I'm not necessarily opposed to athletes striding close. A lot of successful big leaders do stride close. Very, very few of them stride, uh, stride significantly open though. Um, that being said, most athletes were looking for a, a good direction to their drive, uh, looking for them to stay behind the ball, 
and this is this is one where long toss really seems to help directionality um, for athletes that do need to work on that. But for guys who stride way open, way close, and that works for them, something like long toss or, or crow hops where you're adding linear momentum uh, isn't always the best fit for them because they need to be able to stride a little bit off target to, uh, to get to their release point. So again, not necessarily right or wrong answer here, but I'm gonna give him a good for this. He's able to make it work. Uh, comes out of the drive early. That's kind of the next next thing we look for. Um, that goes hand in hand with, with keeping that vertical shin angle or staying into the heel as long as possible. Um, so he's, he's not coming out of the drive early. He's staying into that back leg. He's staying engaged with the heel late and then he's rotating through. What you'll see is a lot of athletes, they start the drive and then they immediately begin to open up the pelvis versus staying in it, that extra, you know, three, four, or five frames right here. So he's staying in that drive for a long period of time, holding that knee back. Now he lets it release late down into the target. Now he lets that knee drive, release and drive down to the target late. So that's, just, that's another thing to identify. When athletes, they begin to drive, they immediately come out of that and the pelvis begins to open. Um, he does not do that, so he gets a good. Uh, lunging slash overstriding, we, we kind of already touched on this with the, uh, the pushing or overextending the back leg, so I'm not gonna, not gonna go through that too much more. Um, back knee drives down into landing. Um, we touched on this a little bit, um, but this is very connected with uh, staying into the heel, um, the directionality of the drive, um, and then not pushing and overextending, but when that all happens, you'll see that back knee drive down and corkscrew down to the target, or down to the ground rather, uh, versus overextending with a push from the quad. So that back knee does drive down, he doesn't triple extend, he doesn't try to lunge or jump off the back, off the rubber. Uh, foot, mainta foot maintains ground contact at release. So when athletes struggle to segment the pelvis from the torso, what happens is you'll have one of two things. You either land completely open, where the pelvis is open at landing, but the torso is also open at landing. And so any rotation from there, you'll see that foot usually come off the ground and that knee just shoot forward into release. Um, that's one option. The other option is that the pelvis is closed at landing, so the pelvis is still facing third base, and the shoulders are also closed at landing, facing third base. But because they're not segmented, and you'll see in Stroman's case, he has this nice big stretch through his torso because he's he's got that hip shoulder separation where the belt is facing almost straight towards the target and the you know the letters are facing towards third base but you'll see uh, when you land hips closed and shoulders closed everything comes together and you'll get the same same kind of effect that foot will come off the ground and that knee will shoot forward into release and usually that front leg will kind of buckle as well he doesn't do any of those things so we'll give him a good there uh, lateral versus vertical ground reaction force. Um, so this gets into what we were talking about with the leg lift and that initial weight shift. When there's a bad initial weight shift and the first move that has to happen is reaching that, that front hip forward versus kind of leaning into the target, sitting, coiling, and then driving. Um, when that's the first move, the force being generated off the back foot, most of that is going uh, at a relatively vertical angle and that's all being kind of lost. That energy is going up into the sky or down into the ground and then the, the reaction to that, the ground reaction force, is going straight up. So that's, that's wasted energy. When, when a pitcher can shift his center of mass forward during the leg lift and then create lateral angles from there out of the back leg, that force is going back into the rubber towards second base um, and it's, it's much more usable energy. It's the same reason why uh, pull downs uh, raise the potential velocity for almost everybody that does them is because you're adding a ton of linear momentum into the system um, that you don't necessarily, you still have to be able to sequence it and capture that linear momentum, but it, it raises almost everybody's velocity potential because you're adding in all of this uh, potential energy from the starting uh, run up. So same thing here, if we can create more lateral momentum through the system and still capture it and time it well, it's more potential velocity than just wasting that all straight down to the ground uh, and it's not really doing much for the system. So he's creating very lateral, uh, lateral direction, lateral ground reaction forces off the back leg, so he's good there. Uh, okay, let's get into pelvis. Um, do the hips clear into landing? Um, now this is important when it comes to uh, creating hip shoulder separation. 
the hips can't land completely closed. You don't see any hard throwers that land with the hips completely closed. That the hip rotation needs to already be happening into landing. You'll see his back knee corkscrews down and the belt opens up into landing. And because of that, the hips have cleared. The hips are facing uh, almost entirely towards the target. Obviously, they're not completely there. They get there over the next couple frames. But the hips are very, very close to fully open at landing. Looking at the belt loop, so his hips do clear into landing. Uh, is he rotating down versus spinning into landing? So a lot of times you will see um, rather than this, and he's doing a good job of this, where from here that back knee rotates down to the ground and the pelvis almost rotates down into landing versus just completely spinning off towards first base. Um, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, one way to tell is what the front knee does after this point. Um, if you're spinning into landing instead of rotating that back knee and that pelvis down into landing, this knee usually will cave out and around towards first base and that foot, you'll see the weight start to shift towards the outside of that foot and off the, the midfoot, off the center of the foot. Um, you'll see very even, even landing on the front foot and you'll see that, that front leg brace uh, more or less directly backwards. Um, when guys rotate down into landing, when you spin open, that knee kind of caves out and you can kind of you can kind of tell and see it on the follow through. So you can see that reaction of the front leg. He's doing a good job rotating down into landing and the front leg responds in kind. So we're going to give him a good on that. You can kind of see the direction this analysis is going. He doesn't do much wrong in his delivery here. Um, pelvis moves independently of torso. Uh, it's a little bit redundant, but it's basically saying, look, the pelvis needs to be able to rotate underneath the torso. So as the pelvis goes, he needs to be able to hold that torso position back and hold that thoracic spine closed. And again, you can see right here, he's able to do that. Um, now this is, this is a move that takes good mobility through the thoracic spine to be able to pull off. Uh, if you're completely locked up through your thoracic spine, you're not gonna get this arching position. You're not gonna get, uh, you're not gonna get the thoracic extension, but you're also not getting, gonna get the thoracic rotation. So both of those components are important uh, when it comes to thoracic spine mobility. Um, back hip internal rotation is important, but uh, it's not necessarily the most important thing. There are big leaguers who throw hard without perfectly uh, mobile rear hips. Uh, my opinion, it's more important to have the relationship between that, that back hip, the pelvis, and the thoracic spine. So at least being mobile through the thoracic spine, especially if you're not mobile through that, that back hip internal rotation. So right here, I think that's where a lot of the, uh, a lot of the velocity is really coming from. And you can look, uh, look into this more a concept called the spinal engine, uh, a concept about really where, where power is generated from. Uh, and, and it's the relationship between uh, the spine, the lumbar, thoracic spine, and pelvis, and the angles that are created there, the, the rotation, uh, but also the lateral flexion at that position. So his pelvis is moving independently of the torso. They're not stuck together, rotating together. Okay, what's happening at his torso? At his torso, we're looking, is there excessive counter rotation? You'll see some guys um, where they, they're completely showing the numbers, uh, you know, their numbers, their name to the batter, um, but in doing so, it actually costs them being on time with their, with their arm action, with their arm spiral. Um, Madison Bumgarner is kind of an example for guys who can picture his delivery. Um, he's able to get it on time, he's able to get his arm up and, and sync it all up. But some guys, they get so closed off and it actually screws up the direction of their throw. Um, so that's not necessarily a right or wrong answer, but in general, um, if you are too counter-rotated, it can, it can lend to some timing issues. Um, so in his case, he's, he gets a little bit of counter-rotation, he gets some of that coil, but it's all perfectly timed up and that arm's in a good spot to rotate from. T-spine and hips are in a good spot to produce force from when he gets to landing. So we're gonna give him a good for that. Uh, he doesn't have early torso rotation, which is what we, we talked about before. That's when the pelvis and the, the upper half are kind of linked together and the, hip, the hips land open, but whether for a mobility reason or otherwise, you know, these letters would, you'd be, you'd be seeing the letters right now. You'd be seeing the, the whole, uh, whole team name right here directly over top of the belt versus this dissociation. So he's, he's not doing, he's not getting any early tor torso rotation. So we're going to give him a good there. Uh, torso doesn't segment from pelvis. Uh, kind of same thing as, as moving independently of the torso up here. So we're going to give him a good there. Uh, bow flex bow. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to stand up to explain this one. Uh, so the bow flex bow is basically a concept that Paul Nyman came up with. He observed that with a lot of hard throwers, there was kind of this whip crack phenomenon where there was this loading, 
and then there was this unloading of the spine. And so what he saw is that the bow, the first part of the bow, was this initial drive position where there was a little bit of a hunched over posture, a little bit of a more kyphotic, uh, rounded position during the drive. And then as they go, got into landing, there was that, that unloading process where you get the flex. So the bow, flex, and then as they rotate with that big chest thoracic extension, they get back into release, and that's the final bow. So the spine goes through this whip-like series of, uh, of flexion to extension rotation, back to flexion rotation. So it's, it's this bow flex bow phenomenon. That's what Paul Nyman referred to it as. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna go with that, give him credit where credit's due. Um, but you can kind of see that with Stroman here. You'll see he's got this loaded position, this athletic torso position. That's the initial bow. Now he unloads into landing. This is the flex. He's in thoracic extension and rotation. And then the final bow, he's in, again, thoracic flexion and rotation. So going to give him a check on the bow flex bow. You'll usually see this with guys who don't segment their hips from their shoulders well, or they're, maybe they're really, uh, really lacking somewhere in their thoracic spine. They kind of just rotate their, their thoracic spine as one, one big kind of block. Um, they don't get this uh, big chest position where you can see that wave of energy working its way through the spine. Um, Stroman's creating a lot of, he has a lot of motion through his spine. You can see this energy transferring its way segmentally up the chain in this big arched, uh, big chest position, that arm's lagging back and getting this big stretch through his chest. Um, you won't see that with guys who just kind of rotate all, at, all as one unit. Uh, this feeds into the next thing we look for. Um, I'd say we're, we're probably getting uh, about halfway through here. Um, so scapular dig, this is the next critical concept. This is basically as the shoulders begin to rotate, the arm lags just a hair behind that rotation, and in doing so, the shoulders, lead, the, the torso leads the way and this elbow lags behind just a millisecond. In doing so, it creates this rubber band, uh, rubber band like effect through the pectorals. So he gets this big stretch through his chest and as he's rotating, his torso is leading the way and that arm is coming through loose, late and quick. What you'd see if he wasn't doing this is you'd see the elbow leading the way. The elbow would be somewhere out here, out in front instead of staying back in line with the shoulders and you wouldn't get this quick reflexive uh, action through the, through the pec, um, you'd get the elbow leading the way. So he's actually leading the way with more of his torso and kind of armpit area and the elbow is, is lagging back and that's extremely important uh, in creating this, this reflexive uh, fire through his chest. Um, we're kind of covering the, the next point too, arm lag, reflexive pec fire. Um, anyway, in doing so, what happens with that lag is the scapula. The scapula uh, gets to a position of full retraction and I wish there was a, a view from first base here um, so that you guys could see that. Um, if you guys could see, if, if he was, let's say, throwing without a shirt on and from first base, you'd be able to see what the scapula is doing. That scapula gets posteriorly tilted here and fully retracted right about here. Um, that's a javelin term called scapular dig. Um, and what's happening is he's getting full thoracic extension, full thoracic rotation, and he's also getting a little bit of lateral flexion towards second base. So I'm gonna give him a good on that as well. All right, let's get to the, the next thing, which is that the arm slot matches the torso rotation, uh, and also that the, the rotation of the torso happens perpendicular to the spine. So I'm going to get up and demonstrate this one real quick. Um, first thing to understand, if you haven't already read some of my content about this, I'm going to link an article in the, in the description which explains this whole concept of rotating the torso perpendicular to the spine but I'll try to cover that real quick in about 20 seconds. So all that means is that the rotation isn't happening, it's not forward flexion into ball release and it's not just completely spinning off. Um, it's happening, whatever your spinal position, the rotation happens at 90 degrees to that. If my spinal angle is completely, uh, completely parallel with the ground, the rotation is happening here. If I'm a little bit more lean back, that rotation's happening here. If I'm a little bit more lean forward, that rotation's happening here. So the rotation happens perpendicular to whatever the spinal posture is. So you see somebody like Tim Litscomb where he was very, very arched, very, uh, very back towards first base at landing, and that resulted in a very upright arm slot. You see somebody, maybe a submarine pitcher, their torso angle is very bent over, 
and that results in a lower arm slot. So the arm slot is a product of that spinal position and that rotation happens perpendicular to whatever that spinal angle is. That's all it means, it's not as complicated as it sounds. And then the second piece of that is that the arm slot matches that rotation. So if my rotation's happening in this plane, the arm needs to find its way into that plane. If my rotation's happening in this plane, the arm needs to find its way into that plane. And for, for whatever arm slot you have, the arm slot has to find its way into that plane of rotation to maximally transfer all that rotational energy into the arm. If you're, rota if you're rotating in this slot right here, and the arm finds its way up here or down here, then you're not actually getting all of that rotation into the arm as you would if you find it into that same plane. So let's go back to what Stroman's doing here and see how he looks. Okay, we can see his spinal position here. He's fairly arched and from this position we would expect that arm slot and that torso rotation to come through right about this slot. His shoulders rotate, he comes through right in that exact slot and you can see this is the plane of rotation of the shoulders right here. That elbow finds its, its way exactly in line with the shoulders. So you'll see guys, maybe they'll get a high elbow, that elbow will be up here. They tend to be pushers. They tend to push with a tricep into ball release. You'll also see some guys where that, that elbow finds its way too low towards the torso and they're kind of throwing uphill a little bit. Uh, his, his elbow finds its way right in line with the shoulders and right in that plane of rotation. So he's able to rotate properly, but also get all of that rotation into the ball by finding its way directly into that same plane. So I'm gonna give him a good on both of those. You can kind of see where this is headed. Uh, excessive tilt slash rotation into release. Um, we all know what this looks like. This is where maybe that head is pulling off, the, the torso is pulling off, and instead of being in kind of an athletic, uh, athletic angle releasing out over the front foot, you'll see that head way off towards first base. You'll see this rotation way off to the side and his body will be set up almost as though he's throwing behind the left-handed batter. So if he were to throw a pitch behind a lefty batter, um, you know, you'd expect to see him releasing the ball out here. You'd expect the head to be over here. You'd expect this, the Mets logo to be over here. It'd be yanking way off to the side and over rotating. Um, so that's, that's something common that we, we often see, uh, especially with guys who tend to have command issues or um, you know, they have been cueing, let's say, high intent, and they are trying to throw harder, and it's, it's not a bad thing that they're trying to throw hard, but when that intent is misplaced or mistimed, it can negatively affect command uh, if it's not properly synced up through the entire kinetic chain. So he's not doing that. I'll give him a good there. Uh, throwing uphill slash shoulder tilt. Um, this would be, and I wish we had a side view of him here too. Um, this isn't quite a side view, but sh the shoulder tilt, um, it's not a problem to get some of this, this shoulder uh, tilt towards second base. Uh, in other words, his, his uh, back shoulder is kind of dipping towards second base. He's, he's utilizing this frontal plane. He's getting that glove side up a little bit. That front shoulder is a little bit high. That's not a problem. The point is at landing, he needs to be able to take this angle take this shoulder tilt and get that back to level so that he can effectively get down through the ball uh, and get over his front side. So what does he do? He gets from here, he's still uphill, and he starts to bring it back to level. Right at landing, he's almost completely level with the shoulders. A little bit of tilt, but very next frame he gets the shoulders back to level. And from here he's in a really good position, hips open, shoulders closed, arm up, scap retracted, scapular dig, stretch through his pec, Torso is going to rotate on plane, arm lags back, elbow sinks up perfectly in plane, arm lays back, spirals out and around, and he's doing everything perfect at this point to get downhill and through the ball. So again, the shoulder tilt's not a problem. As you get a good drive through that back leg, you're going to typically see that upper half have some tilt just as, a, as an equal and opposite reaction to what that those lower half is doing. It's more a matter of can you get back on top of the ball and get those shoulders back to level, and he does in this case. All right, let's talk about the throwing arm. Let's talk about what his, his, uh, what his arm action is doing. So uh, one of the first things we look for when it comes to the arm action is does that arm swing, just as a whole, does he capture momentum, not only out of his handbrake, in terms of this initial pendulum action, versus a, you know, a forced uh, pulling back of the ball out of his glove, does he capture this momentum from the handbrake, not just that initial move, but as he swings the elbow up 
and back and spirals the arm up. What does that loop of energy look like? What, is that a smooth, connected flow of energy with no pauses, no lags? Or are there hitches and stabs and jerks uh, through, that entire, through that entire loop of energy? And I think we can all agree that he's got a very smooth, a smooth loop of energy from here all the way through that spiral, down into handbrake, into scap retraction, into bar release. So I don't see any lags here throughout this entire arm spiral. Um, so I'm gonna give him a good on that. Overly pronated slash supinated. So what you'll see, you'll see some guys, uh, he's, he's got a relatively neutral wrist, maybe a little bit pronated, uh, a little bit, not even, he's pretty neutral through, through here. But what you'll see is some guys are, they're basically pointing, uh, pointing that thumb way down to the ground or even, uh, even more extreme than that, they'll kind of have the ball facing up towards the sky. So they're really, really overly pronated. Uh, I'm just gonna stand up and kind of demonstrate this real quick. So where he does a good job of kind of capturing that momentum and letting that arm spiral up and keeping more of a neutral wrist. Some guys it's very stabby and that first move is to shoot that ball down into pronation and they have a ton of tension that they're holding through that entire pronated flexor, uh, through the entire arm swing. So the very start is jab down and then it's, they start to get into these positions in the backswing where it's not a smooth flow of energy, leading with the scap, capturing momentum, and then driving towards the target. It's very first move, thumb down, engage, squeeze hard through your flexor pronator, and it just it, it drives a very tense looking arm action when that's your first move. Um, and you tend to see elbow climb, uh, you, just, you tend to see guys run into a lot of issues when it's not a loose flow of energy and they're either overly pronated or on the opposite, they're overly supinated and they're creating a ton of tension just on the opposite side and their very first move is back here. What you see in almost every hard thrower, it's a neutral wrist or maybe slightly pronated and then from there, they're not creating much tension through there. They're letting that relax uh, and sink up into the throw when the time comes. So I'm gonna give him a good on that. He's not overly pronating or supinating. Uh, he's also not overly flexing or extending the wrist. Um, you'll see you'll see guys that do this, where uh, just like pronating and supinating, very first move out of the glove, they start to hook the wrist. So they start to flex the wrist. They come back here, and then that starts to lead to issues. The arm tends to be late getting up because they're reaching back behind them, flexing the wrist and the arm doesn't have time to actually get up. When they can keep a neutral wrist and let it just spiral through its natural path, the arm gets up easy, no problem. But that, that hooking, the flexing of the wrist, it creates issues here, it also creates issues into bar release, where the, the wrist is just an extra, extra moving part that doesn't need to be there. And then you also see wrist extension. This is usually guys that are missing layback. Uh, they're missing external rotation, they're missing abduction through their, through their chest or scapular retraction. And so they try to get that layback, they try to keep that ball back, and as they begin to rotate towards the target, they tend to extend the wrist and try to keep that ball back as long as possible. But the issue is not actually here. The issue is somewhere through their chest, through their subscap, through their lat, whatever is stopping them from being able to keep that ball back. And so they try to compensate. It's usually a compensation through the wrist when you see the overactive extensors and you see them trying to extend the wrist. So in Stroman's case, he's not doing either of those. We'll watch them real quick. At landing, neutral wrist. He's not overly torquing that ball towards second base. He's also not showing the ball towards the target. It lays back, still neutral. Neutral wrist position at ball release. And then we'll get into uh, the D cell in a little bit. So I'm gonna give him a good on that. He's not overly flexing or extending. Uh, elbow in line with the shoulders at landing. Uh, this kind of goes back to the shoulder tilt aspect, um, but we're looking at landing. Uh, the line of the shoulders is the elbow there. And then like we talked about, does that elbow stay in line as he rotates through? And in his case, it does. Uh, late slash early flip up. So we call this the arm flip up. The arm flip up is from that initial downswing of the arm action to that arm right here. That arm flipping up and being able to, to be visible uh, behind the ear, behind the head at landing. Um, this is more for like three quarter guys, uh, over the top guys. You're not necessarily gonna see this for lower arm slot guys or guys with kind of funkier, you know, maybe more deceptive arm action, somebody like a Max Scherzer. 
doesn't really get that arm way up and back behind him. Um, and he kind of hides the ball a little bit more. But in general, this is a sign that you have good range of motion through your chest, through your, through your upper half. You're creating good segmentation. And so we call this the arm flip up. It's just what, exactly what it looks like. The arm flips up behind the, behind the head. And you can see that very clearly with, with Stroman here. Despite this kind of offset angle, you'd be able to see it a lot more clearly from a front angle. Uh, so anyway, late flip up is, you know, at landing that arm is still facing, is, is still down. So instead of the, you know, right at landing here, that form is vertical, perfectly on time. You would see maybe that form instead of being vertical, you'd still see that form horizontal, even, even uh, lower than that. Uh, and so it's, it's not on time and it creates a, a poor energy transfer from that position. Um, You'll see a lot of coaches hypothesize that, that you know that's maybe why a certain guy got injured, or and I, I'm not necessarily going to go to that extent and, and say that you can pinpoint it on one thing, but it's definitely what I would consider a timing flaw, and affects your ability to uh, adequately adequately accelerate and recruit everything here in good uh, centrated joint positions. So he doesn't have a late flip up. He's he's right on time. Uh, he also doesn't have an early flip up. Early flip up. Um, you'll see the arm action uh, kind of lead the way in the throw, and that arm gets up super early. Uh, this would be somebody like Pedro Strope, who kind of gets that arm up really, really early and then kind of leaves it there for a few frames and then kind of crashes it down into landing. Uh, obviously, you can still do this and, and get away with it and throw hard if you sequence everything else right. Um, that's kind of an example of an early flip up where the arm kind of gets up too soon and kind of then there's a weird delay and instead of this one fluid flow of energy from the ground up with the arm coming in right on time, uh, that arm gets up kind of early and, and just kind of hangs out there for a few frames. Um, so he's, he's not doing either of those, he's right on time, that arm just gets up. I'm going to give him a good there. Uh, elbow flexion, 90 degrees, now this is elbow flexion at landing. Um, 90 degrees, give or take about 10 degrees. So I'm not going to say that every pitcher has to be perfectly at 90 degrees at landing. He's, again, not a perfect side, side view, but he's right around 90 degrees um, if you were to measure this angle between his this elbow flexion angle. He might be you know, 80 degrees, somewhere in there. Um, doesn't have to be perfectly 90. Uh, there are some factors that will affect the optimal angle for each guy. Um, you know, I, I think valgus carrying angle is probably one. I think uh, anthropometry, I think the, the relationship between their, their humerus and their, their form is probably one. I think their, their mobility and the, their overall uh, height is probably one as well. Um, so there are some things that probably affect what is optimal for each guy. It might not be exactly 90. That being said, you don't see a lot of hard throwers where that elbow is at 130 degrees of flexion at landing. And you don't see a lot of guys where that ball is you know, the, that hand is pinned to the bicep and that ball is right next to the ear. You just typically don't see it. Um, so somewhere between 75 to 80 degrees to maybe 100, 105 degrees at the absolute most uh, outer limit. So somewhere in this range at landing, um, 90 kind of being the average, he's, he's right around there. Um, so I'm going to give him a good for that. Uh, full scap retraction slash abduction. Uh, we already talked about this as well. This is that uh, kind of linked to that arm flip up, but it's it's the scapula loading position that Paul Nyman coined that term. And it's basically just getting both elbows behind the body. The scaps are both fully retracted, uh, you know, right up against the spine, and he's he's getting huge stretch through his chest. He's he's got that big chest position, uh, thoracic extension, and it's again this is just scap retraction, and then horizontal abduction is basically just the humor the humerus uh, being coming behind the midline of the body. So getting those elbows back behind the midline of the body to create that big stretch. So he, he's doing that for sure. Um, this is one that is very strongly linked to, to mobility issues, uh, especially in the weight room. This is one we see all the time when guys kind of overdo it on the bench press, uh, especially with poor form, especially with bad range of motion. Uh, and they tend to, over time, begin to limit their range of motion and they start to notice it in the throw. But this is where you'll notice it most of the time is they can't get that arm back behind their body as, as much as they used to. So if you're a guy who maybe you had a really clean arm action as a kid or early in high school and you've gotten a lot stronger but you're kind of, you're still missing something, you feel like you've gotten tighter and you're not throwing any harder, um, that's one of the first places you might want to look. Uh, arm drag. So arm drag is linked to having a late arm flip up. Uh, it basically means when you get to that landing position, so he's, land, he's at landing right about here and that arm's up. But let's say his arm was still in this position at landing. Um, drag would basically be you begin to rotate the shoulders, but that arm isn't in the right position. So the arm kind of gets 
flung into the throw late. Uh, I'll put up a video over, over this and kind of show you when I, when I edit it what that looks like. Um, but that tends to be linked to a late arm flip up. When that arm's not in time at landing, the shoulders go anyway and the arm kind of has to play catch up uh, to get into position. And, and they ultimately, players tend to get that arm into position by release, but it's not taking as efficient a path to get into release. So that's arm drag. Uh, limited layback, this is strongly linked to not getting full scap retraction uh, and horizontal abduction. When guys get really tight through their chest, through their lat, maybe subscap, maybe they have a, a tight subclavius so their clavicle isn't moving properly. Everything up here in, the, in the, uh, the shoulder complex needs to be able to move and articulate properly for that arm to loosely get into layback. When I say loosely, I mean that arm shouldn't be forced into layback. It should naturally, uh, naturally get thrown into layback as the shoulders rotate and that shouldn't be a forced position. So in order to get that type of, of motion out of your shoulder, you really can't have any major tissue restrictions through here. Yes, there's a little bit of a genetic component, um, what's called humeral retroversion, just having, uh, uh, well, that's not, not as genetic, but a humeral retroversion is basically the, the torquing of your, of your shoulder joint uh, from throwing through your through childhood. So all that, uh, all that external rotation stress uh, through your joints in childhood, playing you know playing little league for 10 plus years um, before puberty, it can actually uh, create a torsion on those bones and lend itself to getting a little bit more layback at the shoulder, a little bit less internal rotation, but a little bit more external rotation at the shoulder. So that's one thing. But then then there is a genetic component to it with just how loose your joints uh, naturally are. Uh, that being said, definitely if you're a guy who isn't getting full layback and full being about. Uh, about 180 degrees relative to the torso angle. So he's right about there. If this is his torso angle, his external rotation is right about 180 degrees. Um, if you're not a guy who's getting at least 170, um, that's probably something I would, I would look into. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean go torque on your arm into, into external rotation and just go, go do weighted stretches or hold a dumbbell behind you. Um, that's a good way to stretch out your shoulder capsule and, and probably get hurt. Um, but I would look at kind of indirect things that could be contributing to layback. You're not going to get good layback if your clavicle is stuck down by a sticky subclavius. You're not going to get good layback if your pec minor is stuck down from a, four straight years of bench pressing heavy with no mobility work. Your pec minor is an anterior tilter and a horizontal adductor of your scapula. What do you need to do to get good layback? You need the opposite of that. You need horizontal abduction and posterior tilt of the scapula and retraction of the scapula. You need the opposite of what that pec minor does when it gets short and gritty. So I would check out some of these indirect soft tissue uh, uh, factors that could affect your layback rather than just going and torquing on a joint that has really crappy soft tissue uh, restrictions, kind of keeping it in place. Anyway, he has good layback. We're gonna give him a good on that. Uh, elbow pushes forward. This is kind of linked to bad layback. Um, when you're missing layback, what you'll see is that elbow leads the way as opposed to staying in line with the shoulders or a hair behind and the torso leading the way and the arm just kind of getting shot through. The elbow leads the way. This elbow would be instead of here, it might be out here or up here at release. And this is when you'll see kind of dart throwing positions. We call it, we call it pushing or pushing arm action. Um, this is when you'll typically see guys will get uh, Distal, distal tricep, little tricep discomfort um, because they're basically doing a dart throwing pattern. They're using their tricep to throw the ball. They're not getting this spiraling out position where the arm spirals out into release and then internally rotates from there. So he's not doing that. He's not pushing the ball. I'm gonna give him a good straight elbow, neutral wrist at release. Uh, we touched on this, but let's go to front view. Where's his wrist at release? Where's his elbow? Straight elbow, neutral wrist. He's not, well, this is obviously on fastballs, but uh, curveballs would be different, sliders would be different. Changeups it would be more pronated, but neutral wrist at release, releasing it off the middle finger, and a straight elbow at release. Arm works independently of torso. Um, you'll see this all the time where um, guys kind of link that arm motion to their torso position. Let me, let me demonstrate that real quick. So rather than the torso moving independently of the arm and the arm is clearly doing its own thing and syncing up but working independently, 
you'll see guys get into landing position and somewhere through that energy flow, they'll basically link those together. And instead of it being the smooth flow of energy where the arm works separately and that energy flows through the tip of the whip, they'll, maybe they'll get to release point and the very next thing that happens is everything gets locked together in that, in that athlete's brain and they pull the torso and the arm through together. Or maybe they get here and they pull all that together. And it's not, it's not this pattern where everything works independently and the arm clearly has its own thing going on and the torso has its own thing going on and then you flow everything together. They lock that, they lock the thoracic spine or maybe they lock the neck and the thoracic spine and the arm together or maybe they just lock the neck and the arm together. Um, but it's not this, this, not this uh, situation where they work independently of one another. So uh, that's just an example. Uh, Max Scherzer might be a guy who, very, very successful pitcher, but a guy who kind of does that a little bit where he gets the ball release and it's everything kind of works together and, and kind of gets locked together. It works for him, but there's a lot of throwers who uh, they'll kind of do that and it's one way to, uh, it's one way to tell if they're kind of misapplying their intent. If they get into ball release and the very next thing they do is just shoot the neck down, shoot the torso down and yank the arm down. It just shows that they're not segmenting and dissociating the different parts of the body that well. All right guys, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there, we're almost done. Um, glove arm. Um, so one of the things we'll look for when we, when we look at a guy's glove arm, uh, his front side, how it works is early supination or swimming the glove arm. Um, so you'll see with how Stroman's glove arm works, he's got that thumb pointing down to the ground. Um, he's, from here, he's basically driving that elbow down and he's sinking it in the plane of his shoulders. He's using that glove arm to screw himself into his landing position and get, the, get himself back over that front side right here. What you'll see with early supination is this glove will basically be turned over early and in doing so it's really hard to keep that glove side closed. So early supination and swimming kind of go hand in hand. I'll demonstrate this real quick. Basically what happens, and in Stroman's case, he keeps that thumb down and that front side screws him down into landing right here. It screws him from that shoulder tilt position, thumb down, and he's got something to kind of hold his front side closed and unload into landing. What happens with the early swimming is their very first move, they'll get here, they'll get supinated early. It's really hard to keep that front side closed if you already have that glove turned over from here. There's really nothing to sink in. If you can kind of keep some, some internal rotation torque on the glove arm, in Stroman's case, he's got thumb down. If you look at somebody like Edwin Diaz, really extreme example, he's almost got the palm facing up towards the sky. It's the same idea though. It's creeping a little bit of tension on the glove side, a little bit of a whine on the glove side so that you have something to screw you down into landing and sink up in that same plane of rotation that we talked about. Just like the back arm needs to be able to sink up, that elbow sinks up in plane, the glove arm needs to be able to do the same. Aroldis Chapman, great example of the exact same concept, but getting a little bit of that thumb down or uh, Edwin Diaz, really extreme example. Um, we're just kind of looking for not doing the opposite of that, not supinating early and swimming open with the glove side early. It should sink you into the plane of shoulders. Uh, works in opposition to the arm side. So all this means, uh, I don't love the term equal and opposite because it kind of implies that there's an exact uh, exact mirroring happening. Uh, this is actually a conversation I had with, uh, with Rob several months ago with Pitching Ninja. Um, but it's not an exact mirroring of each other. Um, but it's also, they also do need to work in opposition to each other. In other words, while it's not exactly mirroring each other, um, they can't be doing completely different things or, or on completely different planets. If this arm is relatively extended, at this part of the delivery, this arm should be relatively extended at this part of the delivery. Right, you, you can't take a picture like, let's say Joe Kelly, for example, really compact arm action. You can't imagine like Stroman's glove arm being on uh, Joe Kelly's uh, throwing arm. They, they need to work in opposition to each other um, to maintain that balance throughout the delivery. And when I say balance, I'm not talking about like a balance point, I'm just talking about um, having something to oppose. Uh, that what the throwing arm is doing. So you think about if you're going to go, uh, you're going to go start a lawnmower, you better hope that, that that glove arm, that front arm, that bracing arm is doing something. It's working in opposition to what that the arm that's starting the lawnmower that's actually pulling the cord is doing. Uh, you can't have one arm doing something completely different than the other, or one arm completely bent and the other arm completely straight. 
Um, there's very few examples of major leaguers who throw 95 plus consistently who do that. You might see somebody like a Jake Peavy who have completely, completely different arm action, a completely different glove arm from their throwing arm. Um, but you really don't tend to see, uh, you know, 95 plus guys who do that on a regular basis. So, uh, do the arms work in opposition to each other? Are they relatively extended while the other one's relatively extended? Um, you know, are they relatively bent while the other one's bent? Are they screwing into the, the same plane at roughly the same time? Um, I think it's clear to, clear to see that in Stroman's case, the answer is yes. So I'm gonna give him a good on that. Uh, retraction slash abduction at landing. We already touched on this. This is that scap loaded position, not just the throwing scap being back and retracted, but that glove side scap being retracted as well. Um, you could refer to this as positive disconnect, disconnection if you wanna to refer to it that way, um, but it's, it's just Meeting, meeting that same uh, retracted position that the throwing arm does behind the midline of the body. Behind the body, uh, we'll go to this position so you can see it right there. Both elbows behind the body, both scaps retracted. That's, that's all it is. So he's doing that. Uh, rotates into the plane of shoulder rotation. We, we already touched on that as well. Uh, yes, that glove arm is rotating down. In, it's rotating in this direction right here. You can clearly see rotating here. And what's the arm slot? It's exactly that same arm slot, exactly that same plane of rotation that the glove arm rotates down right there. So it's rotating in plane, it's not just pulling them off in this plane and then the shoulders are expected to rotate here. Everything is syncing up in that, what we call tornado of energy. Everything is in that exact same plane from that pelvic rotation to the torso rotation, to the glove arm, to the throwing arm, everything gets into that same plane of rotation of the arm slot. And that maximizes his ability to actually get all this energy into the ball. All right, we are almost there, guys. Um, let's look at the lead leg and what we look for in the lead leg. Um, first thing is we're looking if that lead leg opens or leaks forward uh, way early. Um, there are big leaguers who get that front leg open early. Um, this, they just tend to be in the minority. It tends to mean uh, that, that front side is, is leaking open a little bit early and they're not able to get that late snapping down action of the back knee and opening that, those hips late into landing. Um, you're gonna see this tends to be much more of a flaw for the, the externally rotated type of guy where they need to hold that, that vertical shin angle, pelvis closed, and then snap it down late. Um, for guys who are more of the internally rotated type where they kind of uh, they get that knee down early towards the target and then kind of open the pelvis early, um, it's not necessarily as much of a flaw to see that front leg open up. Um, but for, for guys like Stroman, uh, I would consider that a flaw that if that front foot was opening, uh, front leg rather, was swinging out and around open early. Um, the front leg is mostly gonna mirror what the pelvis is doing. So if the pelvis is opening up, that front leg is attached to it, that front leg is gonna open up too. Um, so it's more just an indicator. Um, so this could really be called a you know, pelvis opening up early. Um, but the lead leg is a clear way to see what's happening. Um, so in, in his case, he's keeping that front leg closed and it doesn't start to open up until just before landing, until he's basically gotten to the end of his drive phase. His drive is from here to there. So he's basically keeping that front leg closed and now it starts to open up as he actually gets into that rotational finish to the throw. Um, so he's not leaking open early. Uh, front foot contact. Is he landing on the outside of his foot? Is he landing on his toe? Is he landing way on the inside of his foot? Uh, typically we like to see a fairly even, uh, even weight distribution on that front foot. Um, a, heel, a heel strike is better than a toe strike. Toe strike, typically guys are way too far forward with their center of mass and you just can't brace effectively if you, uh, if you get your center of mass way too far forward. So heel strike or uh, kind of evenly through the midfoot um, tends to be what we're trying to see. And you'll see from his, his landing position, he's got a very even land on that front foot. His foot's not caving out, not caving in, not coming forward, not, the heel isn't coming up. So he's good there. Uh, we talked about the front leg, we already talked about the pelvis, but we're gonna talk about the front leg rotating down to landing. Uh, you can see that works as well. Uh, typically this is, this is kind of redundant, but if the pelvis is rotating down to landing, if the knee is rotating down to landing, the front leg is gonna be doing the same. But again, we can tell this based on the response to the front knee. If that front knee is bowing way out towards first base um, versus kind of extending and straightening into release, uh, that's, that's one indicator that the 
axis of that rotation wasn't uh, was more uh, rotational and less kind of down into landing. So he's doing a good job there. Uh, paw back mechanism. Paw back mechanism is the knee actually extending into release. So you definitely don't want that knee to continue leaking forward after landing. But paw back mechanism is, as we can kind of see his knee flexion angle here, it's actually that knee flexion angle continuing to straighten. And you see it right there. The knee actually starts to straighten into release as the pelvis gets all the way through and as that torso rotates over top. So I've talked about this before too, but the extension of that lead leg, it's not a slamming of that knee. It's not a, it's not a contracting of that quad. Uh, the knee is actually pulled into extension uh, by the hips getting all the way through. Let me demo this real quick, just so you can see what I'm talking about. Hopefully you can get my, my lower half here, uh, Dennis. So the front leg, what happens with the front leg, it's not landing open and then slamming, hard landing and trying to slam that front leg into extension. It's actually landing here relatively softly and then the, the completion of the pelvic rotation, this front pelvis, as this pelvis clears down into landing like that, this pelvis is attached to this femur and that rotation pulls that front leg. As you complete that last little bit of pelvic rotation, it pulls that front leg into extension. So you're actually pulling that front leg into extension, you're not pushing it into extension. And that's a really, really important distinction when it comes to front leg mechanics and how you train that. You don't just train the front leg by doing jumps and trying to stick it or uh, you know, doing lunges down the mound or putting a band around your knee and trying to slam it into extension. Completely goes against how the front leg actually works in the delivery and how you actually create a good front leg brace. Uh, so that's part of the disconnect I see all the time with strength coaches who don't understand throwing mechanics and they try to be creative and find ways to train the front leg, but that's actually not how the front leg works at all. And rant. Okay, so uh, that's the paw back mechanism. He is doing that. Uh, knee stabilization, frontal plane. Uh, so this is what we talked about. Uh, frontal plane being this, the lateral plane here, this plane right here. So if he wasn't stabilizing at landing, so the knee is right here. If he wasn't stabilizing, you'd see that knee continue to leak forward over the next couple frames here, you'll see that knee doesn't move at all. And that knee actually starts to move backwards as the pelvis pulls it into extension. So no, uh, no issue stabilizing that knee in the frontal plane. You'll see a lot of, like, a lot of kids maybe, or uh, guys who don't segment that well, that knee just continues to leak forward and you'll usually see a lot more flexion in that front leg. So he's good there. Uh, knee stabilization transverse plane. Uh, we kind of talked about this before. This is when your weight shift, you know, you kind of fall backwards a little bit towards first base. Um, you kind of spin that leg open early and you'll usually see guys will land more on the outside of their foot. Um, uh, you'll also see this in guys who are lacking hip internal rotation. As they finish their rotation, they actually, you actually need a certain amount of hip internal rotation to get around this front side. But you'll see this knee kind of bowing out towards first base. Let me let me show that real quick. So this is hip internal rotation right here, with the the fixed point being your body and kind of the, the floating joint being your foot. So this is internal rotation. But if I fix the foot to the ground and I want to go through internal rotation, and and now that's the fixed point and my body is the moving point. This is what internal rotation looks like. So what does that look like? That's obviously the position that has to happen as you go into your follow through. So athletes who are lacking hip internal rotation that can't, that can't get hip internal rotation, a lot of times what you'll see, they get into ball release. This is all they've got at their hip. They can't keep going, they get a block. So what happens, a knee starts to, they still have to get that full rotation, they still have to get to their release point. And so that knee starts to bow out, that weight starts to get on the outside of the foot and you'll see that knee shoot up towards first base in Stroman's case. So a lot of times that can be a hip internal rotation issue where guys don't have the range through here to actually complete that rotation. All right, let's get into deceleration. We're, uh, we're almost there, guys. Okay, first thing we look for. Um, so up to this point in the, the throw, we've kind of, we've looked at this energy flow in sequence where, you know, it's, it's hip, it's uh, creating force off the the back leg, it's that knee winding down to the ground, then the pelvis goes and the torso goes, uh, you know, then the scap retracts. It's, everything's going in sequence. Then the elbow extends, then the shoulder internally rotates, then the forearm pronates, 
Um, so everything happens in a specific sequence into ball acceleration. Uh, when it comes to deceleration, everything happens in the exact reverse, or it should happen in the exact reverse. So the very first thing that should happen is that forearm should pronate through the ball. So if that initial uh, flow of energy happens up the chain this way, the deceleration happens exactly in the reverse down the chain. It should happen forearm first, then shoulder, then scapula, then thoracic spine. So let's see if that happens. It's a little hard to tell without high speed video for this particular uh, thing that we're looking for. But what we want to see first thing is forearm pronate. And you can pretty you can clearly see that happening. His his he goes from a neutral wrist here. Next thing, his his palm is already facing the ground. He's pronated through that. Now he's completed that pronation because that joint has has maxed out everything. Now you start to see shoulder internal rotation. That's the next step. So he's good on on pronation from what we can tell from this clip. So that goes. Now the shoulder internally rotates. It's still internally rotating from these three frames. Now that maxes out its, its capacity. Now the next thing down the chain goes, which is the scapula. The scapula now needs to protract, anteriorly tilt. The scapula gets kind of shot up his, up his uh, rib cage, up his body, and that scapula is gonna be you know, closer to his ear at release. There the scap goes, one, two, three. Okay, now that maxes out the motion it has. Now what's the next thing down the line? It's thoracic movement, it's thoracic rotation. And what do we see? We see the thoracic going into uh, flexion and rotation. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the thoracic spine completes that deceleration pattern and it gives the arm a nice long deceleration path. He's not slamming the arm across his body, but he's, he's decelerating it one joint at a time. And again, he's got good hip range of motion here that the lower half can kind of accommodate these positions as well. So let me just show this, this all. He's, he's good on the deceleration front, but let me just show this all in sequence. So he's basically reversing that flow of energy scap, elbow extension, internal rotation, and then forearm pronation, interrelease. Um, and then from there, basically the exact opposite. So we wanna see forearm go now first, now the shoulder goes, now the scap goes, now the thoracic spine goes. So it's one at a time. Whereas it starts center of the body, out, now it starts out, back to the center of the body. So that's the, that's the whole sequence we're trying to, to see for a proper deceleration. One, two, three, four. And then having the range to the hip, five. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, again, I'm going to give him good on all of those. For guys who don't have the thoracic range of motion there, um, what you'll, you'll find some of these guys need to work on specific uh, rotation and flexion work through the T-spine uh, to be able to get a little bit more range out of their follow through from the upper half. And then miscellaneous. Uh, these are things that, uh, at least as of now, we haven't uh, fully categorized um, under any other, uh, other piece. Um, overall tempo, I wrote an article about tempo. I can link that in the description as well. Uh, tempo is basically how fast you're moving down the mound. Um, you can think of it as, you know, a lot of coaches will say, you gotta be a one three to the plate to hold runners. Um, that's an example of tempo. It's how quickly can you get the ball out of your, out of your glove from that first move. That's kind of a, a generic way of thinking about it. The way that I prefer to think about it um, is a way that I learned uh, studying Paul Nyman back in, you know, early 2000s, and the, what, the way that he looked at it was he uh, tried to standardize it across uh, all hard throwers, and they all have different leg lift styles or maybe slide steps some of the time, and they, all, they still all find a way to throw hard despite the slide steps or despite different leg lift styles, or if they're in the windup, and they take two seconds to even get to their leg lift, but then from there they have a quicker tempo, they still find a way to uh, hit a lot of the same positions and, and time through those positions. So he standardized it. He said, I'm, I'm going to count tempo from when that leg gets to the peak position of the leg lift to that very first frame when that leg starts to move down. So right about here. So uh, at that time, it was a lot simpler when it comes to video frames. Most cameras filmed at 30 frames per second, which means that each frame, if you went through video one frame at a time like this, was 1 30th of a second. So he would count how many frames it took to get from peak leg lift to ball release. 
Obviously we can't exactly do that and compare clips when we've got you know, slow motion clips uh, all over the place now. But if you do have 30 frame per second video, that's one way you can kind of compare it. And I go over that in the article. But bottom line is you don't want to be way too fast to the plate or you actually don't have time to gather your energy. Stroman does a good job gathering his energy and then gradually accelerating it and then firing uh, explosively uh, late and then well-timed well uh, explosion. So if you're too quick to the plate, it can make it hard to gather your weight over your backside and, and redirect that and still have time to rotate everything and get it on time. Uh, one pitcher I, I worked with with the Cubs, uh, minor leaguer, uh, AAA, uh, he was throwing 92, 93, and he, I think he was like 0.8 to the plate. That's something they, they had worked on uh, where they're trying to be very quick, quick and fast to the plate. Um, you know, just taking a look at his mechanics and, and making that adjustment, telling him to think more, you know, Max Scherzer, kind of let your weight build, let your weight build a little bit, um, and then from there accelerate. Um, just getting him from like a 0 0.8, 0 0.9 to more of a 1, 2, 1, 3, and gathering his weight on his backside, he was sitting 95, and back to kind of his, his peak velocity the very next outing. So uh, slowing down tempo can be helpful. At the same time, speeding up tempo can be helpful for guys who stall their weight over the, the rubber. They don't shift properly like we already talked about Stroman does, uh, and their weight kind of gets stuck over the rubber. And so maybe they're, uh, you know, 1.4 or 1.6 or 1.8 to the plate because they aren't shifting their weight forward properly um, and they just get stuck. They get stuck kind of reaching towards the plate versus uh, what I would consider drifting and driving towards the plate, which is what Stroman does. So overall tempo, he's good. Check out my article if you want, want specific numbers for how to look at frames and count and tell if your tempo is good, but he's got a relatively quick and on-time tempo, which is what we want. Overall rhythm, um, this is more like this is the, the general, this is more subjective, but it's the general interactions between all the different body parts and how he uh, puts them all together in the throw. So does he have rhythm? Is he, is he choppy? How is his overall energy transfer? Does hip rotation sequence nicely in with torso rotation? Is the arm smoothly flowing into torso rotation on time? It's, it's more how do all the pieces fit together? And I think just watching, uh, just watching him through without stopping the video at all, watching him through, we can agree he has very good rhythm by just about any definition you would use. Um, when it comes to rhythm, I actually like watching full speed video more than I like watching it in slow motion or frame by frame. It's really hard to get a feel for rhythm uh, just watching in slow-mo. And obviously in Stroman's case, you can kind of tell either way, but um, full speed clips make it a lot easier to tell if a pitcher has good rhythm or not. But again, that's kind of a subjective thing. It takes a little bit of a trained eye. Does, does he have good rhythm? Um, so not as scientific when it comes to that. Uh, overall kinematic sequencing, similar to rhythm, but we're just looking at um, do all the pieces happen in order? Does the weight shift happen first? Then does the drive phase happen? Uh, does the knee, knee drive down to the ground, then the pelvis goes, and then the torso goes, and then the humerus goes, and then the arm spirals out into elbow extension, and then the arm comes into internal rotation, and then the forearm pronates. Is everything happening in order? And we already touched on this a little bit. Um, one example of it not happening in order is when guys push instead of this arm spiraling out and around into elbow extension, which is that. Instead of that happening and then firing into inter internal there, they'll get from here, they'll just shoot the elbow forward and they'll, they'll dart throw to the target. So instead of doing elbow extension and then internal rotation, They'll try to do both at once. Um, so that's it. that's just an example of what overall kinematic sequencing would be. But again, this is just a general thing. Is everything happening in sequence, on time, and in the proper order? So we're gonna give them a good there. Uh, properly timed intent. This is a little hard to tell without talking to a player, uh, without you know feeling what they're feeling. Um, but properly timed intent just means they're not muscling up at any one spot of the delivery. Um, they're not getting to, you know, getting to their dry, the beginning of their drive phase and immediately taking over the throw with their arm action or their, their upper trap or they're trying to, uh, to yank that ball up to their ear with their bicep. Um, they're letting the, the throw flow properly and they're waiting until late to actually apply the explosion from the throw. 
When you try to create all of the power from the throw from the very first second, um, you just you bleed energy. It's it's a controlled unfurling of this tornado of energy from the ground up through the tip of the whip. And that's what properly timed intent is. You either see guys who they have high intent, they've been taught that uh, you know, trying to throw hard is how you throw hard. Um, you know, Bernstein principle, you gotta you know, your body will organize itself to achieve a desired goal. And so they will be trying to achieve that and they just end up muscling up and doing things out of order. Um, so that's one example, good intent, but just improperly timed. Another example, I've had, had a pitcher who had near perfect, uh, near perfect sequencing, but it looked like he wasn't even trying to throw and he would be, you know, 86, 88, 90, 91, um, you know, he'd be all over the place and, you know, he'd get angry and occasionally, occasionally, and he'd be 92, 93, 94. And it was, it was a matter of he was properly timed, he was uh, sequenced well, but he didn't understand how to consistently apply a, apply a high level of intent uh, at the right part of the throw every single time. So he just had low overall intent, even though he had good sequencing. So working on that uh, really helped him. Uh, guys who have really low intent, sometimes it's not because they're not trying, it's, it's a lot of times because they don't have uh, a strength base built up. A big benefit of strength training is that you're training, uh, you're training the mind-muscle connection. You're learning how to actually tap into more of your, uh, more of your muscle muscle fibers, more of your motor units. Um, think about a muscle fiber as a room full of, of let's say, 100 light bulbs, and an athlete who has a, isn't able to tap into as many motor units. It's like you try to turn on the switch, and only 40 of those light bulbs turn on, and 60 of them stay turned off. Uh, what strength training does, and one of the reasons that you can get stronger even if you don't get bigger, is that you're training the ability to recruit more motor units. Um, so even if you don't gain a single ounce of muscle mass, um, but you lift for four or six weeks, especially if you're a complete beginner, uh, maybe you can turn on 60 of those light bulbs or 70 of those light bulbs out of the 100, um, just as an example. So that carries over to pitching. It's, it's being able to actually tap into your uh, usable motor units um, that's one reason that weighted ball training works well for complete beginners is they just don't know how to throw uh, max effort they don't know how to tap into their body that's one reason lifting works really well for for beginners for intermediates and carries over so well to, to pitching is it teaches them how to actually tap into the motor units that they have into their in their body but again it's a double-edged sword you need it needs to be well sequenced and well timed intent you can't just tell guys to throw everything as hard as they can and expect it's just going to magically take care of itself uh, when it comes to their patterns. Stroman, as far as I can tell, he's throwing 95% effort. He's throwing smooth but explosive, well-timed. Um, so we're going we're gonna to give that to him there. Not saying he has to be, not saying somebody has to throw 100% max intensity every single throw, but you shouldn't be cruising at 70% effort either. Um, you know, unless your unless your 70% is just way more than enough to, to, to function at, at the current level you're at. Um, and the final one, probably a bad one to end on, we should probably re reorder this, but uh, cervical position slash dissociation. Uh, didn't didn't want to create its own category for the, for the neck position, but um, we're just gonna put it here. Cervical rotation is important because uh, the neck needs to be able to do, to function independently of the torso. If an athlete is missing range of motion through their neck, um, what typically happens, Stroman's got a little bit of counter rotation here. He's, he's you know, showing the numbers to the target, but he's still able to look at the target. He's still able to pick up the target because he's able to turn his neck. If he didn't have the ability to turn his neck, he'd have to actually be, he'd have to be more open to the target as he drove towards the target, and he wouldn't be able to keep that front shoulder closed as long. So you'll either see, you'll see one of two things. You'll see they still maintain con eye contact with the target, but because they don't have good rotation through the neck, they just have to open up early with the shoulders, or they'll keep the shoulders closed, that's fine, but because they don't have the range of motion through their neck, they'll be looking way over here, and so they'll tend to have uh, strike throwing issues. They'll tend to have an inability to, to pick up the target at any point in the throw um, because they can't dissociate that neck position from what their torso is doing. So he's good on that. He's uh, you know he's picking up the target. I'm not saying you got to pick up the target the entire throw, but at some point in the throw um, during that drive phase, you should be able to get that that neck position relatively online with the target. Whether or not it's the entire throw or not, that's that's another conversation. But hopefully you can see from all of this how it all comes together. 
There's a bunch of different segments in the kinetic chain. They all have to be able to work independently of one another while at the same time being able to connect them all in this, the overall flow of energy. The pelvis can't be tied down to the torso. The you know, back knee can't be tied down to the pelvis. The glove arm can't be tied down to what the torso is doing, can't be tied down to what the throwing arm is doing. Everything works independently in this whole kinetic chain. You can think about it like a whip where if anything is not working independently of one another, it's like you have a, uh, you have a whip where one segment of that whip, or let's say you're, doing, you're whipping like a chain, two of those links in the chain were basically uh, stuck, they were cemented or stuck together, where instead of properly segmenting, they just they, they completely stuck together and they rotate together. Um, that represents an energy leak. Um, so that's really the name of the game. It's segmenting everything, it's sequencing it, it's having good range of motion in each joint. Um, it's being able to activate and tap into that, uh, the muscles that govern that range of motion and, and get everything on time. So uh, hopefully you can see now why Stroman is one of my uh, you know, favorite deliveries in the big leagues. I really can't, can't knock him for anything in his, in his motion. I, I really think it's, uh, there's no such thing as perfect mechanics, but there are such thing as mechanics that don't have any you know, clearly discernible flaws when it comes to uh, you know, observing what the hardest throwers in the world do. There's nothing that I would pick up on that, uh, that he could do better um, that, I would, that I would say, that I would suggest to him at this point. So um, again, yeah, if you guys enjoyed this type of breakdown, I'm going to try to figure out a way to make these a little bit more concise, um, but this, this one I really wanted to kind of share our new method of uh, you know, breaking down and analyzing guys with a little bit more of a rubric format. Um, this is something that we are now uh, beginning to do with athletes um, you know, and, and be able to do these as one-time mechanical analyses for any of you guys out there who are interested in getting a full breakdown like this. Um, again, there's going to be a lot more flaws for, for most of the guys watching this than somebody like Stroman. So um, this is something that if you're interested, uh, check out the, the description. We're going to give you guys some more information on exactly what it entails, uh, how much it costs, all those sorts of details uh, right there. But really excited to release the mechanical analysis portion and, uh, and talk to you guys soon. So if you have any, uh, again, suggestions for future, uh, future analyses with different big leaguers, uh, let me know in the comments and uh, any other topic ideas you want to see for Q and A's or future articles or videos, uh, let me know as well. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this, got something out of it. Uh, obviously it went a little bit longer than I was, uh, I was expecting, but I uh, really think there was some value in here for you guys. And if you have any questions, concerns, definitely let me know. Thanks for watching.